it's Friday, it's one o'clock, uh, so it must be time for watching Batman on the same Bat channel as every other week. Um, so today what we're doing is we're, we've asked uh, our, our uh, community member and friend and colleague Frank to lead our session and we're going to be talking about culture but in a, in a rather different way because we're not talking about innovation culture in terms of an academic domain. What we're doing is we're asking an Irishman, a Dubliner based in Cork with all the woes that that entails, a man who founded a very successful uh, advisor companies, which is not a not a bad thing to have in your CV, who's done everything from the, the Cork papers by to insurance and international organizations and advise people on strategy and sales and innovation and everything in between. And I do quite like in, in Frank's uh, LinkedIn, it, it doesn't tell you Frank sells you lots of stuff. It says Frank listens to you. So lis listening is one hell of a skill. So we're going to see now today if any of us have any of that skill as we stick with Frank while he takes us on a whistle stop journey through Irish culture. Yeah, well, thank you very what much. What is it about Irish culture that might be useful to us in our little sphere of innovation? And yes, Frank, now I'll put up the slides and the floor is yours. Welcome and thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll tell you that the long story cut short was uh, one day I got a call from uh, UCC and they said, we'd like you to do a module for one of our master's programs. And I said, cool. Yeah, I'll put a I'll put together a, a, a piece of work around innovation and strat um, innovation and entrepreneurship. And they said, no, 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 we want to do a, a thing about the Irish as cultural middleware. And I said, OK, well, so you spoke about this. And I said, I did speak about it, but I didn't research it. And the lady in, in UCC said, well, this would be a good time to start researching it because we want you to talk about that. So I'll, I'll, if I if I go to the next slide, probably it, I can start the story because I don't want to bore you. I'm, I'm very much a, a history geek, so I'm going to try and stick with innovation as much as I can. The most important thing for me when you start a strategy or innovation process is to understand where you're coming from, what today looks like, present state. And the most important thing to get across as an insight from this uh, uh, afternoon is we're not Celtic. OK, so uh, my own children uh, recently went through secondary school and were told that the Celts invaded Ireland in whatever make up a year that the Irish history syllabus uh, tells us. We are not Celtic. If there is a Celtic thing, it's a cultural movement in the same way as Art Deco or uh, whatever. It's but there, the word Celt comes from Greek. It's a way Greeks talked about barbarians on horses. That's exactly what it is. So it doesn't even uh, talk about a specific uh, ethnic group. It's just crazy people coming in from uh, the um, east and starting to take over parts of Europe. There never was a Celtic empire and we were never Celtic. We arrived thousands of years before the Celts were talked about in Europe. And we came from northern Spain. We came from Galicia and the Basque territory. And I won't bore you with the details, but the Basques are the closest to us in terms of DNA. There are reasons for that, but that's where we came from. And the people who who came to Ireland from uh, the northern Spain originally made their way very slowly over generations through the Mediterranean. And if you go back far enough, they came from southern Ukraine and the Caucasus. And we can see very clearly now with genetic information that that is our route of travel. What you can say about the culture is that these were big risk takers. They left in caracals, uh, ran caracals with their animals and their tools, and they, they traveled so far in, in, in terms of their time to arrive at Ireland. And they developed all of the culture of agriculture. Uh, they didn't develop cities, that was a bit later, uh, but they, they are, if you like, the bedrock of who we are. Our genetic material to use an academic uh, the words of an academic, settled down around about 6,000 years ago, about 4,000 AD, 4,000 BC. What happened later were waves of people who brought in different genetic material and different culture. The Vikings, I think, are the most important. Uh, and they make up a lot of uh, uh, paternal lines, names uh, like uh, um, 
oh, I've forgotten that the Coppinger would be an example of an Irish name which is uh, which is originally Viking. Um, there's a bunch of them that you probably know, like Doyle. Doyle means somebody who comes from Denmark as opposed to Norway, somebody with dark hair. So they, they were a big movement. The next big movement were the Normans, very small amount of people, but huge impact because of the power and their intermarrying with rich, powerful Irish families. So their names like um, uh, de Burg or Burke, uh, names like um, Fitzgerald, Fitzmaurice, but not Fitzpatrick. Fitzpatrick is an ancient Irish family. Uh, then came the, the New English. In the, in the 1600s, huge amounts of stuff happened. Cromwell happened. He wiped out directly and indirectly about 50%, between 25 and 50% of the population. And more importantly, he wiped out Gaelic ownership of land. Critical in terms of our culture. So families who would have been very wealthy suddenly became bereft of assets and they were living day to day. And the land became owned by the New English. And those New English have names that we recognise now as being Irish because they became Irish. So that's, if you like, that's our genetic pool. That's where we come from. Uh, key thing to say, not Celts, Gaelic. Uh, an ancient people, one of the first uh, large groups of Irish, of, of uh, Europeans to build their own culture, their own languages, etc. And we conquered if you want to call that word, conquered Ireland and, and Scotland as a group. Scotty was the name for Ireland. Uh, thank you. That's interesting. <laughs> Scotty is the name for Ireland originally. So Scotty Moore and Scotty Bjog would be Ireland and Scotland. The next slide is the, the next big thing in terms of our culture. And, and this is kind of really interesting. So the Romans did lots for us. We traded with them, but we traded with other people too. We were never conquered by the Romans. The Greco-Roman logic, the way that they solve problems, if this, then that, or if this, then not that, this was well known to us. Uh, wealthy Irish people, uh, well-informed well Irish people spoke Latin as a second or third language uh, and would be aware of uh, Roman culture, but it wasn't a dominant culture. It was a way to solve problems whether linguistically or in terms of uh, problem solving. So that's kind of pretty important. It, it marks us as being among the few in the, the history of European thought. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, this is a very fast trip. We're going from, from, uh, from Julius Caesar to uh, James Joyce. So James Joyce talked about uh, two things at, a one, at the one time. So this was, this is very much part of Scottish literature and Irish literature, is that we have culturally an ability to hold two conflicting points of view in balance and act. The last thing, and act, means we're not psychotic, but it does mean the way we problem solve is very, very different to people from the Roman uh, Empire, which, you know, in case anybody's in any doubt, uh, you can re read Mary Beard, the Roman Empire never failed. The fall of the Roman Empire is a construct. The Roman Empire is very powerful and is still in place today, and it defines places like Germany. So what we have is a, a very unusual way to solve problems in terms of the European experience. It's this capacity to have these two opinions in conf conflicting with each other, but allowing us to move forward to action. And if you think about it, this, this idea, which has been backed up by research, allows us to parse ambiguity so much more effectively than people who would have been brought up in a Romano-Greek uh, 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 logical education system or cultural construct. So it's really interesting. And it's, it's one of the things that we can actually talk about with a certain amount of pride is, you know, Freud said we couldn't be psychoanalyzed. Well, this is part of the story that makes sense what he's saying. If you go on to the next slide, it's a little bit further. So Daniel Pink brings this a little bit further and he talks about us blurring uh, the, the boundaries between intellectual pursuit and imagination, between concept and aesthetic. 
And again, if, if we're thinking about things like being able to parse ambiguity, this is an astonishing, astonishing power to have. It's a superpower. So if you go on to the next slide, uh, you know, I'm just explaining what that means. So ambiguity, well, let's get straight to it. Ambiguity is what drives innovation. You know, the ability to understand black and white, linear or uh, uh, binary is fabulous for understanding the past accounting, for example, or the present operational excellence. Uh, but what, what I teach my customers is that operational excellence pays wages, strategy pays pensions, and innovation as part of strategy is a way of remaking worlds, of reinvention, of creation. And creation is only possible when you move from the black and white into the gray. Uh, creation only happens when you're able to parse ambiguity and move forward. Ambiguity, then action. So move on to the next slide there now. This is the, I've, I think I'm going to keep on with me for my whole life from now on. This is much better than doing it myself. So let's let's have a look at an application of that. So John Cray has this fantastic quote, and we know it's common sense when we see it written down, but we never think about it. So if you if you can receive data but only process a tiny percentage of it, how do you make sense of it? And the answer is storytelling. And it is worth noting that if you look at our Nobel prizes. Almost all of our Nobel Prizes are about storytelling. They're either about literature or about peace, both based on our capacity to write and tell stories and persuade others that those stories are, are stories they should be a part of. So there is an application of ambiguity. Next slide. So apart from storytelling, this ability to uh, make your way through ambiguity is very important in terms of the crack uh, and empathy. And I think in terms of innovation, it's a profound advantage we have over cultures that don't have this inbuilt capacity. And it's no surprise if you look at such a small country, uh, the, the bloke on this slide here created the, the modern theory of money he created the modern idea of entrepreneur because he wrote in French, not not Oskelga or in uh, Latin. Uh, he was born in Kerry. Uh, his name is Catalan. And he's one of many people who have reimagined uh, uh, the the way we think about ourselves as Europeans. Oh, and you're giving me a beautiful picture of athletic young men, some of them without beards. Next slide. Uh, yeah, this probably is uh, the most important, um, the most important kind of sentence I've ever read. So this is Kurt Vonnegut. So a lot of you may know him as a as a uh, as a writer, but his his craft, his trade is as a um, anthropologist. So his his work in terms of research was not writing or English lit. It was actually imagining how people work, and he says we are what we pretend to be. So we should be very careful to what it is that we pretend to be. So if we if we think about Ireland moving forward, I think being aware of where we come from, our genetic stock, the way our mind is set up uh, differently, the historical things that have changed our culture profoundly, uh, Cromwell, the Romans, uh, uh, the Normans, the Vikings, understanding that we also need to be on a journey to be more than simply a better version of our past. You know, to fail better is to reinvent, in my to my mind. So that is really, I'm going to stop talking now and you can ask me questions. After this, there are two slides which you'll be shared with that give you some reading material and some books to have a, a, if you have the spare time. So if you flick down to those two slides there, some nice yeah. stuff here. Um, and that's it. There's a, there's a, there's a, unfortunately you can't get your hands on it. I, I've actually written to the researcher, Andrew McLaughlin and Morgan uh, Bergdorf 
in the IMI did a fantastic piece on innovation uh, and the Irish manager, but it's not published, which is very sad because it's a beautiful piece of work. And I, again, may, maybe in a very kind of functional way, it looks at this uh, difference. It's really important. I want to say this before anybody jumps down my throat. I'm not saying we're better. I'm saying we're different. And in economics, that's the way to compete. Self-awareness about how you're different allows you, whether you're a company or an individual or a culture, the self-awareness of your difference is the is the, the thing that allows you to compete in a global uh, open economy. Stop talking now. Oh. Frank, that was fantastic. Done at super speed. And apologies for the tech woes. Uh, they are, of course, our, our making, not yours. Although we did tell you not to wear that jacket, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know there'll be reactions. I know that I can pile in with a few questions at the start. But is there anybody here who would like to get the ball rolling? Alan, go for it. Yeah, just a quick one to you, Frank, just off the, off the bat. Um, this is all very interesting and, and there's a lot of depth to it, but just as a very shallow response to this and a knee jerk one, how does one go about leveraging all of this stuff? Because it's very interesting to kind of, you're almost framing it as, a, as an innovation superpower, which I kind of intuitively think is right. Yeah, I think it is. Um, and, I, and I'm not just spoofing about it. I think it is a, a certain kind of an Irish characteristic having worked in but most of the folks on the call know worked in Citibank's Innovation Lab in Dublin, which attracted a lot of American visitors and Singaporean visitors and Indian and Asian visitors. And, you know, th they did all actually kind of notice that there was something different about how Irish folks approached innovation. It's a real thing. But but what would your be prescription be to sort of say, how do we how do we how do we bottle it? How do we how do we work with it as opposed to having it just as a kind of a quirk of our personalities? Yeah, I mean, t talk about a big question. I mean, I suppose one of the things about self-awareness is that you would change the education process. So, you know, if you look at the education process up as far as the junior cert, we're in the top, I think, 10 percentiles in terms of performance around cognitive ability, language, maths, etc. And then between the junior cert and the leaving cert, something profound happens that pushes us way down the performance table. And, uh, you know, I can think about my own kids who've gone through it recently and they just said, this is bullshit. You know, none of this stuff is valuable. Uh, we're just learning to learn things off by rote. I don't even care about this stuff. I just want to get my points to go to leaving cert. So at a very important uh, two or three year period, we haven't designed uh, the leaving cert around our competitive advantages. You know, so building up curiosity and building up, uh, and I know it's getting a bad name, but I think for, you know, as a shorthand word, building up resilience and curiosity will make us more powerful, given where we're coming from culturally and historically and genetically. And we don't do that with the Leaving Cert. Uh, so that's that's one kind of practical thing we need to, to tackle. The challenge is I've gone, my kids are through the Leaving Cert. I'm not emotionally invested in it anymore. And that's why it stayed the same for so long. But we are going to fall behind countries that are deeply invested in reinvention of education if we don't change quickly. I know for sure, looking at the data, that it doesn't suit our personality. Um, attracting, you know, attracting industry that is heavily invested in understanding ambiguity seems to me an obvious thing. So, for example, things like data centers uh, are really to a great extent most of the jobs are about understanding black and white uh, building huge amounts of um, employment among uh, code writers interesting much more exciting if we focused on creating software architects who are artists who are floating through ambiguity and working the best way to architect software not doing the the binary the understanding of black and white um what else um i mean sorry there, there are a couple examples i'm not going to go on but that, I, we, we, we're not giving ourselves all the opportunities that we have laid out for us uh, and it's because we're not designing to our strengths uh, to a great extent we've replicated uh tools that work very well for 
the British Empire. And they're so different to us. There are Anglo Saxons and culturally their you know their their cultural experience over the last uh, thousand years is massively different to, to ours. Yeah, lovely answer to a great question, Alan. I think we can ask that question again in 20 minutes and it would still be worth diving into then. There are a number of hands up, but before we go to those, Shirley asked a question about the article that you said is not published. Can we access it? Can you share it? Is do we need permission? Should we should we all rock up on someone's doorstep? <laughs> I yeah. think you need to put pressure on the IMI. I rang up the IMI and said, I actually I I, I done the module for the master's program, and uh, I'm doing a, a script for a TV, and some of the stuff that I had quoted I hadn't put down the primary source. So then I was trying to find the secondary source. Yeah, I've done that, yeah. yeah. I, bet, I bet you it's in this bloody thing. So I rang up the IMI and they said, yeah, yeah, we have that, yeah. That's great. Can I get a URL? And they went, uh, it's behind the paywall. And I went, OK, oh. sweet. Nice. Yeah. Sorry. Frank, if, sorry, sorry to jump in there. Frank, I would I'd love to actually read it. So if you have a copy of or if you can send me what information you have on it, I'll put my email in the message. We um I we might be able to get it through the university is the first thing. I'm also on the council of the Irish Academy of Management, and I know really well the editor of the Irish Journal of Management, which is a one star journal. It's fairly lowly, right? But we're we're always yeah. looking for editors. So if it's not yet accessible, yeah. I may be able to help with that. So That'd that's just something. I just thank you so much for your insights and. Just what is what you were saying is so true about the Irish innovation attitude compared to Anglo-Saxon. And I think we almost need I, I've worked in the past in a past life. I worked a lot in the US and we almost need an Atlantic definition. I find I understand people in Boston sometimes understand me better than people yeah. in Birmingham. And that's just that's just the way it was. So and so thank you so much. And I have another call at 1.30, but I'm so glad I could could be part of this. Thank you. Thanks. Now we do have three hands up and there are some good, really cool comments in the chat. So I think we owe the hands up first. Shane definitely first and Darren and Charlie, you can then decide on time whether you'd like to go to, to go to the chat or to take your point. Mr. Holland, over to you. Um, yeah, I really just a quick question, Frank, because um, the I, you, when you talk about this sort of ambiguous way of thinking. Um, I'd, uh, I'd I'd love if you could sort of give us an example um you know i mean i get the whole black and white thinking as you say if this then that when you say ambiguous thinking i'm reminded of that irish joke of you know someone asked for directions and the guy says well if you're going to there i wouldn't start from here is is, is that kind of what you're talking about or well, there like there are two like the 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 basic kind of uh, uh brain setup is that we're able to hold two things that are in conflict so you're looking at a problem from in three dimensions Whereas uh, most European cultures will take the evidence, work through the evidence and move forward towards a solution. So we are not like that. Uh, we, uh, and I, when I say we, uh, I would have noticed, for example, uh, uh, Irish whose parents were African and uh, you know, I'd be in the car bringing them off to a hurling match or whatever. And I'd be listening to them going, oh my God, they're, Ir they're culturally Irish. So, yeah, so yeah, uh, they, and one of the, the there's quite a few reasons why I, I, I just and apologies for asking you to comment, which is a bad time of the year. Uh, and, uh, Sorry, is that somebody? <laughs> that was a breakthrough channel, I think. There. Okay, uh, so so it's quite like our our culture is incredibly powerful, and it's not simply culture is not simply your DNA. I think you become Irish because you're brought up with it and you just dis you discover that the cultural approach works and then you become part of the milieu, which is kind of interesting. And it's very promising in terms of, you know, what's the future? But, you know, the like I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling to come up with something for, for you that would be an example. Um, I think mammy, mammy solutions tend to be ambiguous. So if you think about how your mother resolves a problem for you, <laughs> probably is a good starting point. But it's that's the first layer, which is holding two conflicting views to get to a solution. The second one is Daniel Pink's one, which is if you think about um, something, something like Ben Okri or Salman Rushdie, uh, a lot of Americans found their literature really difficult 
And there, you, know, you can see on YouTube loads of people explaining how a magic realism works. Nobody ever put up a YouTube for Irish people because we just got it. You know, when Ben Oakry was doing the Famished Road, we understood what was going on. So you had a, 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 a logical progressive narrative that included the real world and the imagined world. And we understood because it's the way we think. So that's the, the, the Daniel Pink comment. And uh, without giving you an example, I would point you towards any Irish pub with good company between 11.30 and 12.30. And that's the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brilliant, Shane. Thanks for that, Frank. Now, the next person up on our little list is Darren. Hi, thanks, Owen. Frank, that was really interesting. I don't know sort of where to start, but I would say I work for uh, RSPBNI, so we, we're a conservation charity and we work in partnership very often in the south with uh, Birdwatch Ireland. And just a point there about that whole thing about Cromwell and the, and the taking away ownership of land, we can still see that now in yeah. that, you know, certainly in other parts of the UK, land would come up for sale quite often and uh, and quite openly but here it's quite guarded and people hold on to it and also yeah. the, the the other cultural dimension of that of course are the turbury rights to cut peat uh, and again that's something that's specific to the island of ireland so we can still see that resonating now but i've always been fascinated with this thing and we all come here and are different from our different uh our different pasts and you know i'm i'm uh, my mother was born in south Derry. my father a uh, protestant from county antrim and uh, I almost feel that it, it's wonderful being from this part of Ireland because I can view myself as Irish, British, uh, even Welsh because yeah. my surname or Scottish from my, my father or uh, even European. And it's, and it's a wonderful thing to be. But uh, I thought to myself as well, you know, especially now where we're having these centenary celebrations or um, marking them rather than celebrating them, there's almost that sense I feel when I'm engaging companies and people in the Republic of Ireland versus engaging organisations of people in Northern Ireland. And maybe you said it there a wee bit earlier about it, that difference between that Anglo-Saxon mentality. It's almost that, you know, yeah. there, to my mind, there almost seems to be that almost like a need for the Republic of Ireland to adopt that innovative entrepreneurial approach, given it's a very young country. And, you know, coming through from where they are, you know, through the change and standards of living and the power of the church and uh, that type of thing. And it's almost that sense that in Northern Ireland, we seem to be maybe have a wee bit of that Anglo-Saxon culture that is a bit sort of as, as you know, uh, our, our health minister is called really doer the other day. But there's always that sense that, uh, yeah, how does that work? Because what we're having to do then is to try and adopt an innovative entrepreneurial approach in yeah. Northern Ireland that's different in the Republic. And this is all in the context, of course, of inexorably moving towards a shared island where we're yeah. all working to deliver economies of scale, which is where it should be. You know, it's a bit of a challenge, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like I did a couple of courses in college. Uh, you know, I went to college, which you could do a business degree and do mad stuff like research uh, the views of hill, hill farmers uh, Presbyterian hill farmers, how they viewed uh, Belfast, for example. And it was quite interesting for me as a southerner uh, to recognise how little I knew about the north. Uh, but if, if I was to imagine a shared island, it would be uh, the majority on the, on the island having to change to allow in the minority. And uh, what recent polls have shown is we're not prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 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 one of the probably the second largest religious group on the island. Uh, I don't believe in in a, a, a god. I don't. Sorry, if I could just cl clarify that, I don't believe in the god, and my god that I don't believe in is Catholic. Just to be clear, so that's the that's my heritage. But um, but I I have to bring my kids into educational establishments that have crosses everywhere, and I I, I find that really disturbing. And if I was uh, from the Presbyterian background or the Anglican background to a lesser extent, I'd find that really disturbing. And so I think when we look at innovation, one of the key things uh, that I do with companies is I ask how they want to change. And then I ask, why do you want to change? And then I ask them over pints, do you really want to change? So, uh, you know, I think we're committed to a United Ireland. Uh, like from from my view, 
I would say that what Northern Ireland brings is less of an Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, heritage. It brings this astonishing power that created the Enlightenment. You know, that is not an Anglo-Saxon uh, led experience. That is a Presbyterian Scottish experience. And, uh, and, and I think some of the ideas around the Enlightenment are the ideas that I would like to see in an Irish Republic in 20 years time. But we have to change the majority. Like what happened in the North is the majority didn't want to change for the minority. And it didn't work out very well. It wasn't a good end point. And if we're talking about sharing the island, the majority have to recognize from that experience that that template will not fly. Uh, getting getting the minority just to you know suck it, suck it up, it's not going to work. <coughs> so, but I, I, I do like, I, I, I think I don't view the Northern people primarily as, Anglo-Saxon, I view them as, as Scots. And I, I think the that you know the fact that the English crown has to uh vouchsafe the Presbyterian church before he becomes king, I think that's so cool. Like it, it reminds me that the crown mm. is a Scottish crown that took over Britain, not an English crown that took over Scotland. That's the end of my cultural mm. rant. Mm -hmm. great, great question, Darren. Thanks for that. Now, Mr. Tuxworth, you have your yeah, choice. My way of balance. Your... Exactly. <laughs> no, I, I think I should say something. If I, as, as I've been shaped and influenced by the Roman Empire, um, I thought may, may as well make some kind of contribution to the discussion if my voice holds out. So apologize for, for what I'm saying or, or how I'm saying it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I coming from, um, obviously coming from the UK, coming from England, lived here for the last 25 years, working north and south of the border. Um, I mean, yeah, I agree. Northern Ireland is so different to the rest of Ireland. The way we work, the way we, we talk to each other, the way we communicate, uh, the way we do business is so different. But Northern Ireland is even more different to the rest of the UK. Yeah. Uh, and there is no no word of sort of doubt in that. Uh, and and a, a really simple example is um, I met my wife in uh, university in Bournemouth. Um, she was born and raised around the Portadown area, um, and there were other people from the Portadown area. If anybody knows any of the history of Portadown, they were through the tunnel. They were from the other side of the tunnel. Um, you can take that to obvious, for obvious meanings. Um, but in Bournemouth, they were all members of the Irish Society. Um, you know, and it was the Irish Society, not the Irish stroke Northern Irish. It was the Irish because culturally they fit better together as a group. And then they would come back home and they wouldn't speak to each other because they were, there was the tunnel divide between them. But in England, they kind of had that relationship. So that was more of an observation. Um, the, the, the question, I do have a question in here somewhere. Um, uh, you, you talked about the, uh, you know, the, all the, the, these mega bits of information that we get blown at, thrown at us, and we can only process a very little bit. Um, I kind of, I do some work around that and I talk about patterns. People feel patterns in their brains. Yeah. Uh, to be able to cope with this stuff so they don't freak out, basically. So is the storytelling kind of perspective on that, is that similar to patterns or is, is it something quite different? Yeah, I, I think what, what, what stories do is they actually uh, put information in context, your context, not the person who's telling the story. So if, if you think about John Hume and the people, other people involved in the peace process in the, in the North, their success was not taught was not telling their story. It was telling their story in the context of the other person. And I think if you look at the great uh, novelists, again, while they're using material from their own lives, their great success is their ability or the availability of the narrative to be understood. When we read the story, we read it completely differently. So, you know, all, all the things that make us different culturally and genetically appear to line up for something like storytelling. And you know, and I, I use the Nobel Prizes as a good example of the extraordinary impact for such a small group of people. You know, and almost without exception, those prizes are for peace or for uh, uh, literature. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so so in, in a world where you recognise that there is massive amounts of data, you know, we're 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 in the world of big data, but the last mile of big data is anthropology. Yeah, and, and it seems that we have instinctively got a good setup to understand that last line of, uh, of big data, turning the imponderable into stories that people can recognize in their own lives and, change, and that will lead them to change their 
lives for the better. Okay, thank you. Also, Charlie, you put up a question in chat, and I think we should bring that out because it's a really simple, concrete question. Whether the answer now is available is, is different. So Irish education system is changing, probably glacial. Um, what other education systems are where they need to be, or do you know of, or have you ever heard stories about who might be doing things? I mean, this came up in the Indian conversation, the Not yep. Just You God conversation we had a couple of weeks ago. I think they are making changes to their system. But is that what we're looking for? Or we should be looking to? Do you have any examples? Well, the, one of my business partners, uh, Roddy Feely, grew up in Brussels. So he, he went to UCD, but he, he did the baccalaureate, international baccalaureate. Uh, and he just said the difference between the two is just fundamental. I don't know enough to go into the detail of it, but I think it, it is more about teaching people to learn as opposed to teaching people to remember. Uh, so the 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 IB seems to be the one we should go as Europeans. I, I I think that's probably where we should be going. We we have a European in the audience. So I'm going to ask him to speak next. I think, but I'll just give you my story because because I can because I have the floor. So I didn't I did bits of the Irish education system, but I didn't do the leaving cert, and I was in the American system. And us Irish poo poo the American education system. But my experience of the education system in America is a there isn't one. B that's not always bad. Okay. The variety and the different ways they have of helping people with different needs. Sometimes they do a much better job at making the right connections with the right people to produce different kinds of results. And in high school, if you weren't a member of the Literature Society or the Yearbook Society, or if you weren't a cheer cheerleader for the football team and you weren't contributing, nobody cared what your grades were. I can't, I can't get beyond you dressed up as a cheerleader. I'm, I'm just stuck at that. Fishnet stockings, Frank. That's the picture you need in your head. Fishnet stockings. Tell you, and a re and a red jacket to go with it. Is that the picture he kept trying to show us during the presentation? Oh, no, 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 cheerleading no, outfit. No comment. No comment. <laughs> so, uh, Frank, brilliant. Thanks for that. Uh, Charlie, do you consider that question answered? Or do you want to come back on that in terms of the overall? No, no, that's great. Thank you. Okay. No, that was good. Thank we, you. We have a European, a non-Irish European, in in the room. So um, that's that's you, the, the the guy with the gloves, Mr. Johnson. Villo, welcome again. Good to see you. What what are your thoughts on that? The education system in Sweden, perhaps, might be a, a starting point. I I think we have. Um, I'm not sure how how it's it's. It seems to be uprooting itself a little bit. Uh, what with the TikTok generation and, and people losing touch with the national memory, so to say. But we have a very, very strong, rigid, fantastic education system for the working class in our, um, what do we call it? We call it worker colleges. Mm -hmm. So So those are owned by the working class and run by the working class for the working class. Uh, and they provide practical education for anything that the unions see. So, so the unions basically run those and make sure that we we have spots for whatever the unions see. So, so we have the working class has their you know way to do upper education, and then we have the high school system, which is really good for funneling people to either university to become white collar workers or to the working to be blue collar workers. So that kind of filters them out. Uh, and I think we have a really good tradition for our uh, liberal arts education. So that one really the ones who do pursue that in high school are very well prepared for for anything. Um, but I'm not sure that the current generation actually see that. And especially for the people who migrate to Sweden and don't have parents who have grown up with this movement. Uh, I'm worried that we are we are not capturing them in. In the opportunities that we can give them. Because this is all all education is free in Sweden. Mm -hmm all the way until you start doing your doctoral studies and then you get paid. So uh, it's a fantastic support system that we have. Um, and there's, you know, we, we struggle with all the same things, I think. Student engagement and all those things, but 
in theory, the system should be good, but of course it can get better. Brilliant. And in, in that vein, I think, you know, the indie example we had in the conversation is interesting. I don't know whether it's a good model. I think if we look at newer countries, Estonia, Lithuania, what will Ukraine do with their education system? Because they're going to build their system 60 years, 80 years after ours. Um, so that, I think that's a fascinating topic all by itself, maybe one we would come back to. But Vili, you, you also had a question for the group today, which was in, in the chat, mm. which is about the uncertainty and uh, innovation management connection. I think we speak, we've spoken to that a little bit. Frank has spoken to it already a little bit, but uh, it might be worth another uh, another shot. Do you want to rephrase your question or put that to, to Frank now? Yeah, because you've, you've been speaking a lot about storytelling, but there's, and that's very important with innovation management, but also there is the aspect of managing uncertainty, right? And different categories of uncertainty, technical, feasibility, legal, value, creation, all of those aspects, and they can range from low to high. Yeah. Is this ambiguity to living in ambiguity, does that help Irish people to manage uncertainty more so than other cultures would? Well, I, I would say we wouldn't be as strong at, at, at PMO as we as other countries. So I think some we would not be instinctively uh, the process end of innovation would be probably where you'd imagine we'd be weakest but you know you have an agency to actually learn those things so if you if you think about Ireland it's it's it is one of the most globalized economies in the world mm. and so what's happened is the generations that I see who are younger than me are very strong at process and culturally we would be perceived as being very weak at process so uh, this is the most incredibly nationalistic thing I'm, I'm going to say today. I think those things are easily learned. I think the ability to parse ambiguity is hard to learn or maybe impossible to learn. So you know what we've seen is the guys who leave Apple, Google, uh, um, Meta, exact, et cetera, bring with them uh, all the tools and the, the attitude towards process management. And so they're able to execute innovation very well. But the the extra the the superpower they might have is that their mammy and daddy brought them up in a culture which instinctively blurs the line between imagination and reality, uh, blurs the line between you know uh, 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 one one you know, set of criteria. So that's that's kind of where I'd put it. Yeah. Hope that's so, not so, too... so then you would so then you would recommend anyone who is who is you know doing radical innovation to have. Irish team members during yeah. their discovery phase? I probably would. <laughs> but I, but I, you know, I, I think, I think, yeah, I think that's exactly the way, the way to put it. I think the, the, the understanding black and white, we can learn. Uh, ambiguity is something we, we learn yeah. at, our, at our mother's breasts. Yeah, and that's the front of your face all the time when you're trying to do high uncertainty radical innovation. Yeah. So you yeah. need to have Irish people on your team. And I like if, if uh, I, the reason I came up with the word cultural middleware is when I was going to these crazy places like former Yugoslavia or going to, you know, one China, one China, uh, I, I found that people on all sides, you know, had very negative views of Germans, English, Australians, Americans, depending on Australians in, in Asia, uh, Americans in Europe. But if you said there was an Irish guy, they'd go, oh, yeah, that's grand. The, the, the guy who for a decade, uh, organized the splitting up of the health budget in Bosnia and Herzegovina was an Irish guy. And he, you know, he had, um, he was as well educated as a, the American or the English or the German equivalent. But the Bosnians and the Serbs just said, we're not having them. Irish, put him on the phone, let's talk to him. And John went on the phone and said, hey, this is the way I do it. Uh, very practical in one morning. Uh, and then out the next morning with the breakup of the budget, and then uh, that sounds great. And that that kind of cultural middleware thing is this capacity for empathy, but also not having a historic history of oppression, you know, which is overstated because we were part of the oppression of India with the British Empire. But let's leave that to one. That's just detail. The re the reality is, if you're if you're a, a leader in Africa or Asia or Europe at the very least were neutral, but in many cases, the experiences they've had, the exposure they've had to Irish culture is a positive. 
Brilliant. Frank, just in terms of timing, we've got another 10 minutes maximum. There are some good hands up again, so I need to come back to Shane and John. But if I could just point out that Paul has put up a number of things going back to the pattern making, it's it's tying together the story making for innovation and culture with the psychology and the, the neurology and what we know about pattern making and uh, uh, name checking a couple of people there. So Paul, if you could maybe represent a couple of those comments and then I'll get time for Shane and John. So yeah, I think, um, you know, it almost goes back to the whole thing about storytelling. Um, and actually the whole thing with storytelling is because that's how we communicated information from an evolutionary point of view. Um, you know, that was kind of how we learned if there was kind of problems, you know, if kind of certain things that were dangerous, it was all passed down as storytelling. And I see one of the, the uh, I think that uh, Daniel Kahneman episode was really about often we can actually be deceived by storytelling because that's that's almost what we're ingrained to take in when yeah. in fact the evidence can actually tell us that the opposite is true. But, you know, it's kind of storytelling can be used both for good and, and uh, bad purposes, but, but it's simply because it's how our brain is wired. And often if you're trying to convince people to do something, you have to tell a story to kind of to engage people because that's kind of what kind of locks in uh, attention as it were. And, and I think, you know, your, your point about the types of problems that people need to focus on um, that and kind of really process, almost like that engineering approach with that's kind of the clock type problems we understand how to decompose problems into manageable chunks that we can then actually put together but actually yeah. the difficult ones are the cloud problems where you have these complex adaptive systems that you need to understand the systemic view rather than kind of decomposing it into into individual parts so that's kind of the the clouds not clocks that's kind of where you know and that's really what things like artificial intelligence are capable of doing is they understand those patterns from the data yeah. and, and that's really what our brain does as well so yeah i think uh yeah if, if if you're if you're evolving your education system and you're evolving your industry to solve clocks or fix clocks or whatever it has to be you're focused on the wrong area of industry you need to think about the cloud problems Brilliant, yeah. Paul. Just to comment to everybody, if you get the chance before we sign off again, have a look at the chat. There's some fantastic connections there. You might want to just save for later because you won't get a chance to look at them all now. Some great links, URLs and so on. And uh, Charlie on storytelling, yeah, horror books are more frightening. Exactly. You make up your own context. Uh, uh, Shane, we probably owe you to come back to you after waiting so patiently. How are you getting on? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, I was just sort of thinking about this whole, you know, the Irish way of thinking. And I guess the, the question for, for me is, is, is that innate or is it um, cultural permission that gives it to us? And That's a great question. Because I'm very fascinated by how, how dramatically our thinking can change when we're given permission to, to do so. Yeah. No, that's a great question, and, and, and that's a whole lifetime research as opposed to being able to give a glib answer. Uh, I think the, one of the interesting things is to see people who come from, you know, a Polish background, or I, I'm thinking of two lads now, a soccer player from Pol his mum and dad are Polish, and uh, um, a guy who plays hurling whose mum and dad are from Nigeria, and hearing them in conversation, you suddenly realise they have been given permission to think to problem solve, to communicate in a completely different way to the rest of their family. And they can describe going home and people being really sh shaken by the way they're they're approaching the world or seeing the world. Uh, so uh, I think that's a lifetime. That's That would be an amazing piece of research to understand what the things are that allow you to lead or to, to have the freedom to think in a different way. But definitely there's, so there's something in Irish culture uh, that is unique, not better, just unique. And I, I, I want to go back and say, I maybe wouldn't say only pick Irish people at the start of the creative part of the innovation process. <laughs> I'm, walk, I'm walking myself back from that because that sounds mad. But I, I think just if you if you meet Irish people, uh, they may bring something different, not necess necessarily better. That's probably a fair way of describing it. So in terms of a diversity, uh, and inclusion uh, process, I would I would say, get people like that. 
Brilliant. Now, John, we definitely need to come back to you before the hour is out. How are you, what, what's your thought for this afternoon? Well, actually, great update, Frank. Thanks for bringing for sharing. And I just, I, the, the slide that you actually had that showed the, I suppose, the, the, the traits, the storytelling, the crack and the empathy. I think that the crack, that one actually is a secret formula. And I don't know actually how to, how to, how to go along actually and put it on it because I think that, that actually, both in the boardroom and out of the, and in the pub, actually, those conversations that actually can take place with that type yeah. of mindset are, are, are um, definitely um, changing. But I suppose the question I was going to ask is, what's the muscle that we need to improve to make us more impactful? Well, that's good. That's a good question to finish an hour with. You've been practicing that. You've been cooking that up for 50 minutes. <laughs> Well, yeah, you. like well, some of us wonderful, you know. There, like there are, there are two things I, I was thinking about in terms of organizational behavior. One is the crack, and the other is informal power. Uh, so, I, I think the, in organizations like the UN, World Bank, etc., the Irish come to uh, prominence because of these two things. Uh, Jerry Canelli talks about uh, building his company against Getty Images and being bought out by Getty Images for more money then six months later, getting images were worth. And he, he describes how he'd go to conferences around the world and own the Irish party. So he'd bring every single member of staff, because he didn't have that many members of staff. They bought the maximum amount of duty free and they had the Irish party. They had a big suite, they could fit 120, 140 people, and that was it. And over, you know, within less than a year of the global circuit, people wanted to be invited to that party. And if you wanted to be invited to that party, you weren't buying from Getty, you were buying from his company your, for your photographs, for your ad agency. So that kind of uh, very uh, practical use of crack uh, to build business is kind of interesting. This, the second one is uh, in the book I'm writing, I talk about in the 19th century, the squatty was incredibly important. The squatty is not that different to the Roman uh, centurion. They all did things the same way. There was uniformity and there was consistency. If they were going to invade a part of Germany, they did it the same way, they did it six months earlier. And they, you know, and if they had process change, the whole army process changed in the same way. And up as far as the First World War, that was very powerful in terms of war. In fact, I'll go back as far as the 1860s, up as far as the first industrialized war, which would be the Civil War in America, that was brilliant. What you found in the uh, American Civil War and the subsequent war is the the uh, outlander, the guy who didn't follow orders, the guy who followed process if it worked and then ignored process if it got in his way. That person tended to be the one that built informal power. They'd be a, a corporal or whatever, but they were brilliant at not being killed in the sun. And they became more powerful than the, govern the, the colonels and the generals. And if you look at organizations, even ones that are as uh, almost autistic as the UN or the World Bank, in those companies, you find people who are Irish or like the Irish, who build informal power. They will stick to the rules if it gets them from A to B. If the rules get in the way, they go around it. And I, I think the muscle we, we need to build is that unorthodoxy. That, that kind of capacity to recognize that there is no formal order that stands in, in absolute terms. If the, if the order works for us to get from A to B, we do it. And if it doesn't, we subvent it. Uh, and so that, th those two things, using crack to change business process and using uh, uh, this uh, organization or non squatty mentality to make your organization more effective. They're, they're the two things that we need to do more of. I wasn't as successful as the gentleman actually with regard to having that party every year. But when when I was when the company I worked for actually was bought out by, by the US or we were integrating with them, I used to spend a lot of time over in the US and we used to go along and actually set up a thing called the Thirsty Thursday evening, which is when <laughs> the uh, the Irish guy used to go along and put the credit card behind the bar in, in the local Irish pub as it happened. And I that was I, I learned more in those two or three hours on that Thursday evening than I did in the week or the two weeks prior to that actually being in the office. Yeah, there's enough lot to be said for. 
Fantastic, John. I think on that note, we have stolen enough of everybody's time. We have extracted as much as we could from Frank's brain. It must be melted at this stage. Well done, Frank. That was fantastic conversation, fantastic conversation Thanks, starter, Frank. great links for all of us. So if anybody has a last word, it would want to be read really fast. But I think at this stage, barring that prospect, we're really talking about see you next Friday for a Christmas coffee stop. And Charlie or Catherine, anything you want to add in terms of arrangements, or are we happy to leave it at that and enjoy the weekend, everybody? Uh, I think we'll leave it posted on LinkedIn for next week. Yeah, it's just a coffee stop Thank you with so a Christmas much, feel. That was yeah, very I was going to say the same thing. Frank that, Frank, that has to be one of my favourite Innovate Island events of all time. It was really, thank really valuable. Much. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, and well done. Have a good thank weekend, you. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Thanks, bye-bye.